wise and angel God, the creator of all humankind, the sustainer and perfecter of grace, even in the midst of tears. Dying, you destroyed the death of those we honor and remember this evening. Rising, you will restore the life of those. Come, O oh God, come in the midst of our trauma and our suffering and explain to our hearts that before another wounded soldier dies, we who are many, yet we who are one, will rise in abject spirituality and say no more. Bless, O oh God, mothers who have lamented their sons. Bless, O oh God, those who use their creative energy to write brilliance and to speak within the harmony and melody of the cycle of life. Each man, each woman, each child in this place is in your God. Speak to their heart. Speak in an inalienable word that sounds a clarion call to stand. Stand in the midst of chaos and proclaim peace. Stand in the midst of years and years of the agony and the pain you so much share. Bring your peace, O oh God. For only your peace can make this chaos be still. Only your peace, O oh God, can lift us from the valley to the mountaintop. And we know that there is a voice speaking inside of us this evening that says, what can I do? What must I do? And the voice says, stand. When you don't want else, stand and recognize I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To he who is thirsty, I will give without price for the water of life. They should forever be my sons and daughters, and I shall forever be their God. We ask this, O God. We name it, we believe it, in the righteous name of the one who is the creator of the moral, physical, and spiritual universe, Abba, our daddy. Amen. My name is E.R. Ship. Several months after I arrived in Baltimore, I began to notice the violence, that is to say, the daily headlines, the mounting death toll. I noticed, and then I kind of didn't notice until something happened that made me ashamed of my indifference. And so I did what I do. I wrote something. This is what I wrote for the March 12, 2013 issue of The Sun, or as a lot of you call it, The Sun Paper. This is the thing that gets me. On March 5th, I saw the front page headline 
Six killings continue by 2013 start. And it did not faze me one bit. It was not news. It was what I've come to expect in Baltimore and all major American cities. The news, as we say in this business, is not when a dog bites a man, but when a man bites a dog. Or when, as in my hometown, New York City, there is such a law in the killings that that is the news. Homicides in the city and deep freeze for seven days running, Newsday reported on January 25th. I might still have paid no mind to what the sign headline said, except that a good friend called from Philadelphia to tell me that one of those killed was the brother of another friend of his. That headline now had meaning. I paid attention because I had a name, Tabitha Wheeler, and a story about this 33-year-old star-crossed man, dearly loved by his mother, his sister, his girlfriend, and her children. Condolences poured into them via Facebook and email. I became angry at myself for succumbing to ennui, and even more angry at those who harbor killers in our midst. People like those who a March 4 headline reminded us conveniently become blind, deaf, mute amnesiacs. Family decries brave silence after son killed, this newspaper reported, about the lack of progress in the investigation of the very public stabbing death of a 15-year-old boy following the Ravens' post-Super Bowl victory celebration. Quote, they all say they were there, but they don't know anything, the teenager's mother told the son. After noting that about the same number of people showed up for a vigil for Mr. Wheeler as showed up the previous New Year's Eve for one held by the mayor, I quoted her. Too many people in our city have lost respect for human life, and too many of us have stood by and watched. In another time, in another language, the headline might have screamed, as Emile Zola did in France, J'accuse. Not so much condemning government, but condemning we, the people. Like 90% of Baltimore's 217 homicide victims last year, Mr. Wheeler was a black man. Like many of them, he had a checkered past. Shamefully, that makes it easier to ignore the death tally. This is not man bites dog news, except among his circle of family and his friends. Well, that was 2013. I know, as do you who are gathered here tonight, that we are all members of that circle of family and friends. Every lost life is news, must be news. We must say their names. I work with words. Tonight, you will hear from my extraordinarily talented colleagues who work with music. Most of the time, through my words, I appeal to the mind and maybe occasionally to the heart. What you will experience here tonight will appeal to heart and soul more than my words ever will. Lamentations have drawn us here tonight. When we leave this place, I can say with much assurance, our spirits will be revived. So I welcome you again to A Mother's Lament. Our MC is Dorothy Johnson Spite, the founder and national executive director of Mothers in Charge, Inc. A licensed family therapist, Dorothy is, a prominent, is prominent for the rights of children and families. She has a distinguished career in victim advocacy, Following the tragic murder of her son, Khalid Jabbar Johnson, in 2001, over a parking space dispute, Mrs. Johnson's spite, along with other grieving mothers, 
found in the nonprofit organization Mothers in Charge Inc. to join us, 
We need each and every one of you that are here tonight to find a way to make a difference in this country around the issue of violence. We are losing too many, too many loved ones to violence. And it's gotta be something we all must do. Yes, you can applaud because yes, we need each and every one of you here to get involved. And there's something that each and every one of you can do. You don't have to have a PhD or any of that to get involved to make a difference. We don't want mothers to keep coming to us because they had to bury their children. So tonight, I want to thank, first of all, Lindsay and Dion Stringer for the vision and the courage to put this together tonight. Please give them a round of applause. We have a vision to make a difference through music, and we know that music can heal. And that's what our country needs today. We need a healing. We need healings in our communities. We need healing in our families. So tonight I'm hoping when you leave, you will feel a little bit of peace of, of the healing that he wants to project here tonight. I'm sure you will feel that. And maybe with that healing, you'll take it and you'll share it. And maybe we can begin to see a change in our communities around this country. Um, a little bit about the next person you will see, a uh, video that you will see. Um, and her name is Catherine Cooper Nicholas. She is executive director of Sisters Saving the City. She is another woman who has taken her pain and turned it into something powerful to make a difference. Um, I think we have the video coming up next. And the words, is Catherine Cooper Nicholas here? Can she stand?
My name is Catherine Nicholas. I am the mother of Andre Jermaine Nicholas. Andre was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and um, May 25th, 1986. Andre was uh, killed on October the 11th, 2014. He was killed by a mentally ill friend uh, who beat him to death. Uh, he said he heard voices, and the voices told him to kill Andre. My greatest fears was that he was not going to live a full life. He just seemed to be the kind of young man, even as a little boy, that he knew what he needed to do. And that could be conflict with your parents, but the things that he felt he had to do weren't necessarily bad things. It's just that, well, he's too young to want to do these things. And that's dangerous. But he would do it with such zeal that as a parent, you believe that he had the best answer. I knew something bad had happened on the Saturday night that um, Andre was killed. Um, the report, the death report said that he died at um, 941 that Saturday night. And at 850 that night, I started crying and I had, I cried and I cried till 10 o'clock that night. I've never done anything like that in my life. I was just sick. I cried and cried. But at that point, I still had not heard from my dream. So I knew and I just started praying. I said, God, I know he's with you now. And I, um, I tried to go to sleep. I did not go to church that Sunday morning because I wanted to be there when the police came to confirm that Andre had died. The detectives rang my bell, and um, so I looked out the window, and they showed me their badge, and my body just started shaking, and one of the detectives said to me, he said, you, were, you act as if you were expecting us. I said, yes. I, I knew you were coming. I, I've been waiting for you all morning. I knew. I want people to uh, remember Andre as a very outgoing and loving person, very generous person. He just had a smile, the, the smile hit you before anything else. That's how I want people to remember him as a loving, caring, giving, giving kind of man. Loving, that was Andre. Determined, that was Andre. Laughter, that was Andre.
Beautiful. Give them another round of applause, please. My name is Alice Oaks. I am the mother of Irvin Lawson, date of birth November 22, 1976. Irvin was murdered January 25, 2008, in Baltimore City. And I'm also the mother of Larry Henderson, 
um, his birthday, August 4th, 1983, and he was murdered May 3rd, 2014. Well, as they was growing up, they was church bound, I kept them in church, and then outside, you know, they, they were good kids, so when they were outside, I really didn't fear so much for them when they were younger, but when they became teenagers, my greatest fear was losing them to violence. As which I did, so that was my greatest fear. I remember one time my son Irvin had a dirt bike, and so I tried to throw out the dirt bike, steal the dirt bike. So he was shot in his ankle from no money. So that was my first fear of them getting, them getting hurt. Well, at least Irvin at the time getting hurt. Larry called me about. I want to say quarter to one in the morning and told me that we call Urban Nephew, that's his nickname. So he said, my nephew just got shot because he woke me up from my sleep. And, uh, but then the phone, you know, there was a cell phone, so the phone just went dead. And I sat beside the bed and I said to my husband, I sound like Larry said that the nephew just got shot. So I just went into the bathroom and came back and I called Larry back. He was just out screaming and phone. I don't know, I'm on my way out of the hospital, so I put my clothes on my dad's shot trying. Now, a lot of people, my son had a lot of friends, so everybody was in the shot trying to stand around. And then when I saw a daughter, he was standing at the receptionist desk. And she says, they want you to go into this room. And that's when I lost it, because I'm in that room. I know that room meant me, so. I, um, the doctor came down and um, he said it was too many gunshot wounds. So we tried to say it was just too many gunshot wounds. And um, I asked him to go see him. And They get to see him. And, um, you know, he just had his glow, he was so glossy, he had his glow about him. And I just kissed him and kept kissing him, told him I loved him. First, I went to the state's attorney's office, which is, which is the family from where he was sitting, FBC. And then from there, I went to save survivors against violence everywhere. So I was seeking counseling for the loss of um, Irvin. But this report kind of brought me through, and I was able to help someone else go through their pain. That that's that's about maybe a couple years later. <sighs> Life called me about I guess it was about 11, 30, 12 o'clock that Saturday morning, and I said, "Mom, what you doing?" And I said, "I'm cooking breakfast." Okay, we're fixing up with Kevin. Kevin's my great nephew. Fixing up the cabin, we're going way up there. So I said, don't have me fix all this breakfast if you don't come. He said, we're we almost there. So they came and we had breakfast together. And um, we stayed for about an hour too. So um, I gave him some money and all. And um, I hugged him, I told him I love him. And be careful, I'm going to tell him to be careful. So he always did, he says, but I told him I loved him, but be careful. Man, you always say that. You know, like you want something to happen. I said, no, I said, things happen. So just watch your back. And um, so he left. I had an appointment like four o'clock that Sunday. Every night I was going to say, it's getting ready. In the bedroom, put on my makeup. And um, something said, Alan, you got to find Liza Shores policy, and you got to call Mommy's free mom and buy him something away. But as quick as I thought, it's that quick as it left me. So I just went on, finished making my face and got dressed. Left on my appointment and my Bluetooth right, and uh, this girl said, Miss Alice, what's up with box? Because they call her a box. I said, Another one. Well, what's up with what's another one? Well, call this phone and see if you're going to answer. I said, Look, you keep asking all these questions about my son. What's going on with my son? So they said, um, Somebody from well, Facebook, rest in peace box. So that's how I found out. And I'm just screaming and beating on the steering wheel and just saying that my only son. 
I believe so, just crying and screaming that her life was on. He was shot. And um, my husband knew about it because it happened 26 and 7 in the evening. The detective that went to my house to tell him, you know, because he had my son's um, ID. But my husband was trying to wait for me to get home, so social media got to be friends. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, he was murdered, they found him. He not hung them in Brooklyn, but that's where they found his body, right? So they took him to Brooklyn and that's where they found him. I blame the streets. I blame the people. Not all people, but his friends. And I also blame them because they was too trusting. Everybody was their friend. Both of my sons had children. So I had seven grandchildren. Larry had three and Irvin had four. But I wanted to be mom because they were good children. They were good sons. They were good boys. Good men. So they they would give you their heart if they could. Because they they were so kind and giving and loving. But I wanted to be your mom with them. They mattered to me. They were my life. Strong, loving, and handsome. And that was Irvin. Strong, handsome, and kind. And that was life.